Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's pray. Lord, some of us have known you a long time, and some of us just a short while, and some are still reaching out for you. And we pray that because of today, we would all know you better. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, it's my privilege and pleasure to be able to share with you on this wonderful occasion. If you've got a Bible, please do turn to Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. And I want to just tease out a couple of points for us this morning. But today we celebrate two momentous events, both of which are jubilees, both of which are anniversaries. And the first, of course, is the anointing of Elizabeth to be our queen, the queen of England. And the second is the anointing of the church at Pentecost to make Jesus king around the world. The queen has sat on the throne for 70 years, although Tiffany, my wife who teaches little five-year-olds this week, was saying to her class, the queen has sat on the throne for 70 years and one very smart kid puts his hand up and says, no, that's not true. She hasn't actually sat on a throne for 70 years. Smart kids in Oxford. Around the world, the coronation was watched by the then new technology of 27 million Brits watching it on TV. That was 75% of the British population. Watching it crowded around friends' TVs, uh, most of them didn't own one, and so they arranged, and they had sort of a dozen people all viewing this remarkable spectacle. And the whole service was streamed live, but for one secret aspect, and that was the anointing of Queen Liz Elizabeth, and that was when the cameras panned away. Under and shielded by a golden canopy, held by four knights of the garter, the queen took off her crimson robe and took off her jewellery. And there, dressed in white, she knelt before the Archbishop of Canterbury. Everyone was silent. And he was handed a 400-year-old flask, golden flask, shaped like an eagle. And in it was the coronation oil made of orange and roses and cinnamon and musk and ambergris, better known as sperm whale spit. <laughs> and then he took a gold spoon that was 900 years old and poured some oil upon it. And there anoints the queen in the shape of a cross. He puts the cross on her, on her forehead, on her chest, and on both hands. And the archbishop whispered these words, as kings, priests, and prophets were anointed, and as Solomon was anointed king by Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet, so be thou anointed and blessed and consecrated, set apart, queen over the peoples whom the Lord thy God has given thee to rule and govern. And then she arose, she was clothed in a golden cape, and then she sat on the throne and was presented with the offices of her rule. And she's been an amazing monarch through a period of huge cultural, cataclysmic social change, a paradigm shift, and she suffered much personal pain and trouble in her own family, but with dignity and with grace. The poet Philip Larkin wrote about her for her Silver Jubilee in 1977. Some of us, do we remember that? I remember the street party for that. Not many of us, actually. <laughs> and he wrote this, In times when nothing stood but worsened or grew strange, there was one constant good, and she did not change. And one of the remarkable things about our Queen has been her public faith in Jesus. She's never missed an opportunity 
to tell it as it is, to speak of her relationship with the Lord. One Christmas she said, For me, the life of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, whose birth we celebrate, is an inspiration and an anchor for my life. Just a couple of years ago, a book was written about her titled, The Servant Queen. The Servant Queen and the King that she serves. And since her anointing on that day, 70 years ago, she has faithfully served her Lord and she served her realm. Anointed to serve. And that's what Pentecost is about for us. That's what Pentecost is about for the church. That we are anointed by Christ to serve him and his kingdom. In those words, anointed and blessed and consecrated. The oil is a symbol of the spirit that was put on her. The spirit is put on us to be blessed and set apart for service. Well, let me just draw out a few thoughts from the passage that was read to us. If you've got a Bible, please do turn to it. Acts 1, verse 8, Jesus said this, You will receive power when the Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost ends of the earth. First then, the Spirit anoints us that we might do the things that God has called us to do. We might do the things he's called us to do. Now, the text is often read linking power, dunamis is the Greek word, with witnessing and suggesting that the power is primarily to embolden or to loose, as it were, our tongues so we could speak. And that is true, although I've consulted a resident Greek scholar who admits that actually the Greek is a little bit different. The original language and the structure and the grammar may suggest something else. The Greek more naturally reads as saying, you will receive power and you will be my witness. There isn't the word in there for in order that, but there's the word and. So you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. And what is that power? The word here is dunamis. Some say we get our word dynamite from it. But essentially, the word dunamis is the power to do. It's the power that affects change. And every time we find that particular word repeated after this in the book of Acts, everyone relates to extraordinary, even miraculous events that bring transformation and which witness and testify to the goodness and kindness and love and power of the Lord. Whenever and wherever the power of the Spirit is at work, the dunamis, the power to do, whenever we see that, we see amazing signs and wonders. We see God's kingdom break in and we see lives changed and we even see miracles. Former dean of Christ Church College across the way, a wonderful man called Henry Chadwick, he was a very distinguished professor of church history, world-leading church historian of his era, and uh, post-Second World War. And he said this, he wrote this, in three centuries, Christian missionaries of spiritual but no great intellectual power enabled the gospel to take hold of the entire Roman Empire. It was not simply the truth of the gospel, but it was the power that accompanied the presentation of the gospel that brought the Roman Empire to its knees. I remember reading another professor from York, a historian, um, a medievalist, and he talked about the conversion of England to Christianity. 
And he said, as a historian, I have to tell you that the, that the turning to Christ of the Celts was on the basis of the witness and seeing demonstrations of power, in particular healings and miracles. He says, as a historian, I have to report it. As an atheist, I don't know what to make of it. <laughs> but the power changed the nation. The power evidence of Christ. You will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. Not just the ability to talk about Jesus, but the ability to do the works of Jesus. This is the extraordinary promise of Jesus. It's what Jesus said. John Wimber, the famous founder of the Vineyard Church, uh, uh, an amazing church, 2,500 churches around the world now, uh, in numerous countries, uh, a, a church that's marked by caring for the poor and of intimate worship and of signs and wonders. On one occasion in the early days when he was building the church, the Lord said, I've seen your ministry. Would you like to see mine? Would you like me to show you mine? And he said, go for it. And actually began to rely upon the presence and power of the Spirit, not just the performance of the church put in on an event. And God was immediate and intimate to people and lives were transformed. On one occasion, towards the end of his life, when asked about advice for how to be a Christian, he said, don't just read the Bible, do it. Don't just read it, do it. And what comes be between reading it and doing it is the power of the Spirit. Because without the power of the Spirit, we can't do it. So dunap dunamis is the power to do. The power to affect change. The power to testify for Jesus. The power to extend his realm. The power to serve him and others. The power for some to be martyrs. The power for some to work miracles. The power of a transformed life. The power to pioneer. The power to be creative and bring to birth new things, ministries and charities and wonderful things. You will receive power. Dunamis. The power to do when the Spirit comes upon you and we really feel that today God wants to anoint you perhaps for the first time with the power of his spirit to equip you enable you and send you out to do things for him secondly the spirit anoints us that we might be the people that God has called us to be when the spirit comes upon you says Jesus you will be my witnesses. And again, and I've consulted our resident Greek professor here, there is an unusual sentence structure here. It's not, the you, it's not what you'd expect. It isn't the verb to witness, it's the noun witness and the verb to be. And the emphasis is on being, not just saying, although saying is there. Filled with the Spirit, and led by the Spirit, and transformed by the Spirit, our lives will witness. We will be witnesses. And Jesus says you will be witnesses of me. Not of religion, not of your denomination, not of your dogma, but witnesses of me, of Jesus. And unless we receive and live by the Spirit, there will always be some sort of cognitive dissonance in, in church and the perception of others outside looking at us. They'll say, look, you, you read the book, but your lives don't measure up to the book. You say one thing, but your lives don't measure up to that. Many people look at us and could just say, you're hypocrites. It's not true. But it's the power of the Spirit, His power working in us transforming us that enables us to be like him and when we are like him in the world then we witness to him and to his kingdom and his goodness the wonderful Gandhi he saw it he said I'd become a Christian if it weren't for Christians that's sharp isn't it 
I read of another Hindu who said, I would become a Christian if I could find one. The philosopher Nietzsche said, you'll have to look more redeemed if I'm to believe in your redeemer. And the fact is, we can't be the people that God has called us to be without the power that God has offered us that will work in our lives and that will deal with stuff. We need his spirit to to bring an effective change to our attitudes and our habits and our manner and our heart and those things that hold us back to transform us and to conform us to be like Jesus. God in us and upon us, that's what we need. And God wants a church who long before they open their mouth have made an impression for him. Jesus wants a church who long before they open their mouth have made an impression. That people have looked at us and said there's something different. And so when they open their mouth, then people pay an attention. When Stanley, Victorian missionary, uh, met David Livingstone in Central Africa, he spent several weeks with him. He wasn't a Christian. And then Stanley recorded in his diary, if I'd been with him any longer, I would have been compelled to be a Christian, and yet he never spoke about it at all. You'll receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. It'll change you. And you'll be my witnesses, not just you will witness. And then thirdly, the Spirit anoints us so that we might speak the words God has called us to speak. There will inevitably be a speaking. You can't keep your mouth shut when the Spirit's upon you. The Spirit's a witnessing spirit. The Holy Spirit promotes Jesus. He doesn't promote himself. He's Jesus' publicity agent. And he reveals Jesus to us. Then he reveals Jesus through us. When the Spirit fell on those shy and uh, cloistered Christians and the apostles who were somewhat in hiding, just praying and waiting, once the Spirit filled them, they spilled out onto the streets and went public. The fear had dissipated and they couldn't but speak about Jesus. The Spirit Set the, of tongues of fire, set their tongues on fire. And a crowd gathered, and we know later on from that chapter that 3,000 people responded. The Spirit won't let us go quietly. The Spirit makes us go publicly. I listened to a radio interview a while ago with a senior politician, and he was asked about his Christian faith and whether it, it, it influenced his politics. And he said this, my personal faith is my personal faith and would not interfere with my public office. And then, quote, he told the interviewer, stop banging on about my faith. It was intriguing because the interviewer wanted to know about the faith, but this person who was a churchgoer didn't want to tell anyone about his faith. And he lived this bifurcated life. I go to church on a Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, I'm my own man in public. My own person, stop asking me about my faith. The fact of the matter is that if you are filled with the Spirit, you can't help but speak of it. The Spirit never made anyone quiet. The Spirit never made anyone go incognito in their religion. The Spirit never made anyone an anonymous Christian. The Spirit makes us go public. Every single reference, bar the account of um, Samson when he, he went all macho, every other reference to the Spirit coming upon people in Scripture, they either pray, praise, prophesy, or preach. These words beginning with pra, out they come, and they, set, they just can't help but speak because he's a revealing Spirit who somehow looses our tongue. When the Spirit fell on me, all those years ago, I went. Down, I was a butcher. I, I often say I went down a butcher and I got up a preacher. Like the spirit, I just had to tell someone. It felt like fire going through my mouth. I just had to tell people. I did. I'd tell them in the pub. I'd tell them on the street. I used to pray for opportunities to talk to complete strangers. They probably thought I was a complete nutter. But I just had to tell someone. And it isn't a compulsion. I just have to do something detached from 
from the person I want to talk about. It's because the Spirit reveals Jesus to us. And he makes him so wonderful and personal to us that we then want to talk about him. The Spirit anoints us to speak, to say the words that he's called us to say. And then lastly, the Spirit anoints us that we might go to the places God has called us to go. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost ends of the earth. Ever increasing circles. All the world needs to hear about Jesus. The Father sent the Son, and the Son sent the Spirit, and the Spirit sends the church. Jesus, at his resurrection, met the disciples and he says he breathed on them and said as the spirit he says as the father sends me so i send you and he breathed on them the spirit the spirit is the get up and go of god in us he move when the spirit moves on us he moves us on you can't just sit and stay the same there's movement he comes with a purpose there's there's his agency and then there's our activity Again, I've been thinking about Livingstone, the great pioneer missionary to Africa and a great, you know, champion for abolition. And when he left his missionary college in London, the principal said, where are you going to go? He said, anywhere as long as it's forward. Many Christians are just going around in circles. The churches are going around just doing the same old thing. But the Spirit moves us. Pentecost is a movement. That's, it's meant to move us. And when we receive the Spirit, he moves us on. I love that advert by Church Missionary Society years ago. It said, are you sure God has called you to stay where you are? It's good, isn't it? Now, some of you may find yourself at the moment in a very unsettling period. And you think, what's going on? Well, maybe the Lord is just uprooting you and moving you on. You're meant to move because he wants to use you somewhere else to do something else for the good of someone else. Moving you on. Let me finish. Well, today is the Queen's Coronation <laughs> Jubilee. And what a great day and what an amazing woman she has been. But it's also the church's Jubilee, Pentecost. She was anointed to serve, and we are anointed to serve. You know, she, she became queen, as it were, in 52, but it wasn't until 53 that she was crowned. There was a, a period, there was a gap between the two. And often there's a gap in our experience between when we come to Christ as it were, and seated with him in heavenly realms, and adopted into his family, and become his children, and when we are anointed. Many Christians go their whole Christian life without ever getting what's on offer, without ever receiving that power of the Spirit. And I want to say, God wants to anoint you to serve him today. Maybe for the first time, maybe in a whole new way, maybe in an unexpected way, taking you to unlikely places and situations and people and context. I, when I became a Christian, I was a butcher in Bristol. If you'd have said then what was going to happen to me by 30 odd years later, I was used to selling meat, cutting meat, carrying meat and stinking of meat. And then God fills me with his spirit. And I end up being a priest and ministering in Oxford and talking to all these smart people and writing books and traveling here and there. What an amazing thing. When he moves on us, he moves us on. And the spirit of Pentecost anoints us to be the people and say the things and do the things and go to the places he's called us to go. Amen.